Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Michelangelo stage. Our first speaker of the day is Mrs. Becky Stewart. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for, for joining me first thing. And we've almost, almost gotten more people here than staff members for the conference. So we'll, we'll see how we work on that for the next 45 minutes. Uh, I'm Becky Stewart, and I'm a creative technologist. I thought I'd talk a little bit about my, my background and kind of what, about what, I, what I do. I grew up in Michigan which is in the US. I provided a map for the non-Americans here and maybe for some of the Americans if you need to refresh your geography. But I was a band nerd and a choir a geek, a theater dork. I loved the arts in high school and I also loved math and science. And my teachers always said that you had to choose. You had to choose a path. You, could, you couldn't do the arts and the sciences together. You couldn't do engineering and pursue something a bit more creative like the arts. Um, and so I was all prepped to, to learn, uh, to go study at university chemistry. And instead, I learned about uh, sound recording and getting into the mathematics of sound. I learned about the Fourier transform and the theory that if you have a, a periodic signal that you have a bunch of sine waves can, uh, uh, can recreate that signal. It's uh, the basis behind sampling theorem and how we have digital audio and MP3s. So I went to the University of Miami to study music engineering and then the got myself over to the UK by uh, doing an MSc at the University of York and then a PhD in London here at Queen Mary University of London. And this is where I really found that the, the arts and the uh, and engineering could really come together. And I studied audio signal processing and uh, uh, the way music and sound and, and 3D audio all come together and kind of the, the nitty gritty behind that. As a part of my research, I started collaborating with a lot of artists uh, and designers, uh, kind of helping do the technical part of installations uh, and creative projects. So when I left Queen Mary, I decided that it would be really great to continue that work. I really enjoyed the field. And so I started off co-design with uh, my co-founder, Adam Stark. And what we do is we teach artists and designers and people from creative fields and uh, also children and young people how to use technical tools like programming and electronics to do their own creative projects, their own artwork. And so these are just a couple shots from that where uh, it's uh, this, uh, me at the Maker Fair uh, that we had, the mini Maker Fair at Elephant Castle um, that just happened. And then uh, also just teaching. We teach a lot on, at Space on Mary Street in Hackney. Uh, then along with, uh, the, with co-design work, along with teaching uh, what I love to do, which is program and uh, kind of work with hardware program, uh, platforms like Arduino, I also uh, am a, a partner in Anti-Alias Labs, which is where I kind of do my personal practice. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about the image problem that engineering has. We talk a lot about how kids need to learn how to code, but I think a better question is why do they need to learn how to code, and what can you do when you learn how to code? And so this is the, the namesake of our stage. This is uh, Michelangelo. And he can kind of be representative of the way arts can kind of be misinterpreted as Artists are loners. You're a genius. You're tortured. You're in your studio by yourself, slaving away, coming up with your, your master art piece. And uh, you're not necessarily interacting with the rest of the world. Your genius is very, very focused. And engineering can have the same kind of issue. Now, I'm not here to start making um, detailed arguments against or for Stallman, but he does represent a viewpoint of what it means to be a hacker. If you say hacker within certain uh, realms, you think of an image like this. You think of a man that is not known for his social skills, who is not necessarily an advocate for diversity uh, and uh, the greatest cooperation within, uh, within the technology world. And I just wanted to spend some time today talking about how 
there's two main issues with the representation inside of science and engineering technology programming on that kind of greater field. Uh, the first being that you don't have to choose between the art and the science. That we sometimes try to pigeonhole young people and say, there's a path you have to choose. You can be artistic or you can do engineering, but it's not something that um, is ever combined or we make a big deal about the intersection of art and technology which is really not a new field. Uh, and then also that it's a social, social uh, performance, that you are not just working on your own, either the, as the programmer or the artist. Collaboration is absolutely key. So when we teach uh, young kids with co-design, and work with them on different creative technology projects. We get a lot of, this is what they look like. We have a, a mixture of kids from different backgrounds, and they're not all what would be viewed as the stereotypical hacker or programmer or coder or engineer when they grow up. But they're really excited about what they do. They're not bothered about using technology for a creative project. To them, it's just fun. It's just enjoyable. It's a social experience. There's a, a big science fair that happens each year in the UK called the Big Bang Fair. And when I was doing my PhD at Queen Mary, I was at uh, the one that was in the Excel Center. I uh, know oh this was up in Manchester, uh, representing the, the university. Part of the exercise is you want to attract students in to your university. And that's why you're there to represent it. And there was a really, really talented kid. He had won a prize at, the, at Science Fair the year before, and he was going to win one again that year for his work. And he didn't have a formal background in electronics or, or really too much um, kind of formal tech uh, from his school. He was all self-learned. He implemented in hardware a, a MIDI interface uh, and just did really, really great engineering work and a huge, huge a book of documentation about, about his project. And it was a really, really clever idea and then really well executed. And so I talked to him about what was his plans, what was he going to do. He was going to go off to university the next year. And he said he wanted to be a doctor. He was going to study medicine. I was like, you just did such a great engineering project. You obviously have a talent in this. And he said, yes, but I want to work with people. I don't want to work in engineering. And I think that really is to the detriment of engineering, the, the thought that you have to, uh, you, you don't, you're with your computer, you're with your soldering iron, and you don't get to interact with other people. So I wanted to bring uh, to the foreground four real life projects that I've worked on over the past couple of years and kind of and really focus on the people and the skills that, the, uh, that have been brought together by them. So the first one is the Gloves Project. So the Gloves Project has been going for quite a number of years now, probably three or four years, and the team has, has grown as we've gone along. This is the brainchild of Imogen Heap, who is a Grammy award-winning uh, musician, uh, composer. Uh, she, her Grammy was in production. And she visited the MIT Media Lab a number of years ago, and her stage show involves a lot of the traditional electronic music interfaces. She does a lot of work in Ableton, so she has you know, mixing desks, um, various kind of hardware things that you would see with a lot of performing musicians. And she really hated being stuck behind that. And you know, the, the old joke, you don't know if they're actually creating the music you're listening to or checking their email on their laptop. And she really didn't like that, la that lack of connection with the audience. And she saw at the Media Lab these, these gloves, this project that was being worked on, how you could use gestural interfaces to control the music that's going on. And so she kind of launched finding the team and the people to help her put together and bring to life these gloves. So I have a small video of her demoing these gloves at the Wired uh, the Wired conference here in London last year, last autumn. Um, and then this great thing, which is kind of a bit like um, what I saw Ellie do, um, is kind of catching the grains of the sound. So um, I just, when I have my, my gloves, they're all different colors to tell me what mode I'm in. This tells me, be aware, you're in record mode. Something could happen. Uh, so if I sing, ah, <laughs> So I'm kind of going across 
of the waveform. Fading it down. Penny. More gap between the grains. So those are the gloves. So they're a um, kind of the technical bits are they're an OSE uh, instrument that talks over Wi-Fi to a computer that then can send off messages to do extra things. Uh, so the team uh, is of course Imogen, uh, who's very much the kind of the creative lead on the project uh, and really drives the way the project goes according to her her own needs, her own performance as an artist, which is really great to give focus and make sure that the project is, is a very usable thing that makes sense and is applicable in the real world. And then Hannah Penner Wilson is an absolute expert in e-textiles and wearable technology. So this idea of using not just hard wires and uh, printed circuit boards, things that are um, can very, be very cold and like, a bit awkward to just wear on your body. Uh, she works a lot with conductive fabrics and threads and ways that you can have soft interfaces, like literally soft interfaces instead of um, kind of hard traditional electronics. And then we have Seb Magwick is the, um, he's Sensor Zeb. He uh, is the electrical engineer behind uh, creating the IMUs, the inertial measurement units. So they are the sensors that sit on the hands. Uh, Imogen has a whole bunch of them, one on her back and arms and things like that. But the core ones are the ones on your hands. And they just have all the sensors that say where in 3D space are your hands located. Tom Mitchell then takes uh, that information and all of the information from there's bed sensors in each of the fingers um, and uh, the IMUs on the back and he feeds that into a machine learning, sometimes that's called artificial intelligence algorithm that says, okay, now this, uh, uh, this is a, a finger point, this is an open hand, this is a closed fist and recognizes the gestures from just the signal of how bent is a finger or multiple fingers. Adam Stark is the, uh, the audio engineer that wrote the software behind Imogen's demo there where uh, it's called a granular synthesizer. So uh, he did all and he does a lot of the, the kind of the programming, the interface between the work that uh, Tom does with Glover is the name of the software that kind of takes in all the inputs from the, from the hardware gloves and spits it out again. Uh, Adam takes that and puts it into various music uh, programs for Imogen. Uh, Kelly uh, helps with the production and the setup. It's, a, it's, a, it's not really a consumer ready product yet. And so there's a lot of setup and production to get it even ready for a, for a single performance. And Kelly also helps a lot with the, the user specifications and like, how to translate what Imogen needs into something the technical team can work with. And then last but certainly not least is Rachel Frere. She's a fashion designer. And she came on board first to just help. Is there, there's not a photo in this one. The previous photo, Imogen was wearing um, a far more elaborate kind of uh, costume. And Rachel helped design that. And then she also pre uh, provided really key information about sewing techniques and better ways of actually physically constructing the gloves with her knowledge of fashion and clothing construction to better inform how these gloves can be made uh, in a way that's more robust and also in a, a way that's faster, kind of reducing the amount of hand sewing. And then, so this kind of, a, it's a team photo from us from, now two, three years ago. I don't, I've kind of been in and out on this project. I don't really have a, a very strong, I wouldn't say that I'm a, a core part of this team at all, but I think it's just a, such a wonderful group of people with, who are all incredibly, incredibly good at what they do. And really, um, Rachel probably wouldn't call herself an engineer, but all the rest of them would certainly qualify as engineers in what they do. So the second project I wanted to highlight is uh, sometimes called GPS Shoes, or it's also uh, kind of its full title for gallery exhibition is No Place Like Home. And so this was a concept by an artist and designer, uh, Dominic Wilcox, and he was inspired by The Wizard of Oz. He wanted to make a pair of shoes that when you click the heels together three times, they show you how to get home. And so 
what these shoes do is have a series of LEDs in the front that uh, will help you do just that. This shoe actually wirelessly communicates with this left shoe because here we've got the direction but on this shoe we've got the distance. Here we've got a circle of LED lights and the one in the centre. The one in the centre is on when there's a satellite um, connection and the LED lights illuminate to point in the direction that you should be travelling. And then on the back here, this is where the, there's, a, there's a GPS embedded in, in the heel here. So this is all followed out. And then this little red thing on the back here, that, that's the, um, the antenna. So that's pointing upwards to the satellites. To start up the GPS, we've got a little switch inside the shoes, which allows to detect um, clicking of the heels. So you click the heels together, and that starts up the GPS. It then looks for the satellite signal. I've called it No Place Like Home after Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. So yes, yeah, so this project had uh, is a much smaller team. Uh, Dominic, who uh, normally makes all of his projects, uh, he's very much a maker. He uh, it was kind of a bit of a, of a first for him to uh, have a, a bit of a, more of a team working with him on a, on, a, on an item. So these were handmade shoes. They're really really gorgeous leather shoes from uh, St. Dominic's in the middle, uh, and from Nicholas Cooper of Stamp Shoes up in Northampton, uh, and. So they're, they're handmade shoes that then have been customized so they can incorporate the, technolo uh, the, the technology into them. And so I did all of the technology work on them, uh, so, which was a lot of very small spaces for very small microcontrollers. Um, so I did microcontroller programming, uh, hardware sensor design, and then integrated it all into the shoes. And these shoes have a wonderful life that I wish I could follow them around. They are constantly in places like Tokyo and Italy. They're just in the U.S. Uh, so th the shoes are, are doing quite well. And really, I think the key part of the project was the, the concept is just so wonderful. And it's exactly what Dominic does, is uh, really come up with these, these objects that have a bit of a twist to them. So really, really enjoyed working on that project. This project was a little bit more recent, so the GPS shoes were first in exhibition about a year ago. Uh, and this meta projection jacket was a was uh, an installation and performance uh, this past June at the uh, Tate Modern in the South Tank for a hyperlink exhibit, which is kind of a young people's program there. And so the meta projection jacket is a jacket that has eight cameras embedded into it. So it's a very it's a gorgeous object um, uh, for, uh, made by Radharani. And then I integrated, and then Rachel, who helps with the, with the gloves project, she actually helped me a little bit with the sewing, and integrated eight cameras into it, with the concept being that the wearer um, performs wearing the jacket, and multiple viewpoints can then be projected from the, from the viewpoint of the, the performer. And so for this performance in June, uh, Jacques Green, uh, electronic musician, he performed a, a live set. Um, uh, while wearing the jacket and we projected onto screens around the South Tank the view from uh, what was happening, so kind of views of the, of the crowd. I'm just going to warn, this one's a little bit louder on the sound levels. So the team behind this one, again, it was a little bit of a smaller team. 
Uh, but Rod Hirani is the, uh, the the fashion designer. It's his it's his jacket that we uh, he very kindly let us uh, rip into a little bit to install electronics. And then Jacques Green was the the musician that performed wearing the jacket. Uh, I did the the technology and the the programming. So it's just a um, it's a series of uh, PS3 i cameras. I'll uh, put together into a US hub, USB hub going into an open frameworks application that's then doing the projection back. And then the whole concept was kind of put together uh, by Melissa Matos of Trust, who also kind of curated the evening uh, at, the, at the Tate Modern that day, uh, and really uh, produced the piece and kind of put it together. And it's going to be shown again for a month uh, in Montreal, I believe in October. Another small team project. Um, this last project is very much not a small team. It's another one of these uh, I, I intentionally bookend with the two really large teams. And this one's a project that is currently in progress. So this is being led, the creative lead on this is Di Mainstone, who's an artist who does a lot of work with wearable technology, very body-centric, performative pieces. Uh, he, uh, works a lot with, uh, this is Holly Miller, in the photo, who is a dancer and choreographer that works with Dai in, uh, in much of her work. And so there's usually some kind of attaching things to the body, and then there's some kind of choreographed movement that goes along with this and kind of tells some kind of story. And Dai was very, very inspired by the, the Brooklyn Bridge when she uh, lived in New York for a little bit. And she wanted to know what it would be like if you could play the suspension uh, cables in the Brooklyn Bridge or in another uh, uh, similar suspension bridge. And so she's been uh, exploring how you could have an instrument that involves pulling out strings and then having those strings generate the sound uh, of what's happening. So this was filmed, so we built a prototype And Di and Holly took it to New York this uh, past May and filmed it with the Creators Project, uh, uh, a, a little bit of a guerrilla installation on the, the Brooklyn Bridge over uh, on what the final piece could look like. So again, a very large team and very much an ongoing one. Um, beyond even the, the people I'll talk about directly here, is we have lots of uh, advice uh, and guidance we're getting uh, from different researchers, either at Queen Mary, uh, from the Center for Digital Music, or uh, also from uh, in Copenhagen, the CIID. Uh, lots of uh, interaction designers who are also helping to shape this whole project together. So. The initial, so the kind of the core team of everything, so that's Dai in the background. So this is us in a, in a workshop as we're uh, testing and, and putting together the modules. Uh, Holly Miller is the, the dancer choreographer, but she very much gets her hands dirty in helping make the tech, helping make uh, in particular a lot of the costumes that she wears uh, and has a very strong say into how, what works well uh, and helps shape what how the technology should respond to her movements. Because it shouldn't just be about creating a box with a string and it makes some sounds, but it should be something that's uh, made in conversation with the person that's using it. So the installation will be kind of in two 
kind of two versions. One would be kind of performative with Holly and the other one being public installation, how the public interacts with it is still kind of a research question to be explored. I've done a lot of the, I did the, the hardware sensor design uh, and all of the microcontroller Arduino programming, uh, though with a lot of guidance from uh, Dave Mekin, who's collaborated, uh, he's a technologist that's collaborated with Dai on previous projects and really uh, learning a lot from things like paths he recommended not to go down. Um, so for those who are interested, the kind of the technical details are we keep track of how uh, long the string is, how much has been pulled out of the module by putting magnets on the, the pulley mechanism, and then a Hall effect sensor. So as it goes by, it counts. The, the magnets are, are alternating in north and south poles. And so we see when the polarity has switched, we know that it's just been rotated a little bit. And then once you have the, the number of rotations, you can know what's the length of the string. You can also then get what's the, um, how fast is it being pulled out, how, um, what's the acceleration of it being pulled out as well. Just lots of uh, your fun mathematical equations. Uh, and then the angle of the string is also being being read out through light sensors, uh, just a, an infrared sensor, and just seeing you have an infrared light, and then a little sensor that reads in how much light is is there, and then how much of a shadow is being cast by the string as it interrupts that that light. So David Blair Ross is the industrial engineer, product designer, who has done a lot of the work to the physical making and the, the design of the module itself. Uh, it's been absolute pleasure working with, uh, with, a, with an industrial designer and learned a lot about just physically making a better box uh, for things. Leah Albertini is also another industrial designer, but she's been focusing more on things that are not quite developed yet in the video, which are how do you attach these things to a bridge? How do you attach these things to a person uh, in the cradles and the interaction there? Uh, John Nussi uh, is, an, again, another product guy, uh, but a bit more of an electronics background, and he helped with the, the physical making and design and layout of how the electronics fit inside these small boxes with springs and strings. Adam Stark uh, did all of the sound design work again. So he wrote all of the, the software that generates the sounds as you pull out the strings uh, and have different strings together and whether you have one string or two strings at the same time. And then absolutely essential for any project is Anna. Is she, is our, she writes the grants. She tries to get the money in. And I think sometimes it's a bit of an unsung hero role but uh, the project would not go ahead without her, uh, and she also keeps an eye on the budget. Artists are not known for their budgetary skills, usually, and so it's really good to have someone involved whose job is to, to keep an eye on the finances and make sure that's all going right. I feel like I should also note that uh, slides are all online, but all of these videos are all just clips of longer videos if you're interested in any of these projects, and there's links to where those are. Um, uh, it was a bit too much for today, each of those videos. So those are four real-world engineering problems. That's, it, that's my day job. I love my job. I think it's great. And I think it'd be really easy to get more people into engineering if that's seen as a day job that could be had. But again, we're still struggling with this engineering coding technology has an image problem, has a PR problem. It goes from collaborative classroom environments to people think you end up alone, uh, you know, a tortured genius, working with only your tools like Michelangelo. But I think if we can help put forward that this is just not the reality, that uh, you, uh, you don't have to choose between creative pursuits and engineering, the engineering itself is creative and involves very creative projects and working with very creative people. Uh, and then also that you get to work with other people can really do a lot to encourage people to pursue more technical career paths than they, than they would have otherwise. That they don't think that if they don't identify with the kind of loner white guy who is cool with sitting and not showering and not interacting with other people very well, if they think that they don't, if they don't identify with that person, then it's just not a career for them. I think changing and flipping that around is a way we can get these kids to want to do more than playing around with solar cells and creating little, little creatures, which is what they did in this workshop, to wanting to look at how do they study this, how do they pursue this career through uh, university.
and uh, then a little bit more on uh, how we publicly put a face on what engineering and technology is. Events like this are a really big part of that. This is the interface between people uh, working in the field and the press and other people who are interested either to get into the field or are just fans of, of what's happening. And uh, there can be a lot of great things that happen, but I think you'd be very careful of what's the kind of image put forward. You may or may not know this, but this is the Women in Tech Day for Campus Party London. Uh, so there's a kind of a digital content theme uh, each day. And so the other ones have been entrepreneurship, digital economy, creative industry, or entertainment industry, and then women in tech. And there can be something, it's something that's taken especially a lot of women who do work in the tech field we feel a, we're a little bristled about this how we're not entrepreneurs or women that our gender doesn't trump what's happening here and a little bit of the programming this is the second year this has happened this happened in Berlin as well where the programming gets made so that they fill the stage today this stage will have only women on it until you see Cory Doctorow this evening at 9 p.m. on this stage and otherwise it's all women uh, however, every other day this week, if you were to come to the stage, you would only see one woman. And this kind of packing of the women together can make a very distorted viewpoint of what does it look like to be doing kind of creative design, art, technology, uh, photography, all the things that this, this theme of this stage is supposed to be. So I think a, a little, while supporting women in tech and panels on this, and it's very much a problem about addressing diversity within the field, I think perhaps some more looks and a little bit more thought could be put into exactly what's the best way of putting that forward. It doesn't necessarily help break down stereotypes if this you only see the women on the day celebrating the women and it's not a, just a normal thing. So really my two takeaways are uh, for today are just that engineering and the arts are not two halves of the same, two parts of the same coin. They are a spectrum of study that go together. And that uh, it's not something we have to ask young people to choose between for the careers, but it's something that can, they can come together on uh, and be inspired by the application of engineering within the arts fields. And also that engineering just isn't by itself. The engineering does involve talking with other people. Medicine is not the only field in which you can go and interact with, uh, with other human beings and talk to them all day. There's lots and lots of talking that happens inside of, inside of technology and engineering. So we're a little bit under time, but no one complains about having more coffee breaks. So if you have, I'm very happy to take any questions about anything, whether tech questions over the, the projects that I've, I've put forward or any of the kind of broader issues as well. Um, hi. Uh, well, th thanks for the presentation. Um, oh, one thing is, um, I myself, I'm kind of developer engineer type of person. I would like to be, to somehow be able to approach this artist type of professional. I just don't even know how to reach them, where to find them, and especially because we also have kind of a different mindset on things. So it's also hard to find like points in common where I could, you know, grab and see, mm. let's start a collaboration starting on this, but what is this? I still don't know. Yeah, yeah. So if you could give a few hints or tips. Yeah, on yeah that. completely. Um, so a lot of, are you based in London or elsewhere? No. So I'm, I'm in Berlin, Germany. Okay. Um, uh, certainly in London, but I know in a lot of other places as well, is these kind of hack spaces are starting to pop up. And artists who uh, want to work with technology or kind of already do work with technology, they tend to, they're starting to seek out these kinds of communities because they know there's communities of technical people who... Um, uh, like to spend free time working on projects also in more professional contexts. And I know a lot of artists go to um, like the London Hack Space, which is quite a large one and a very active one, is um, a really good way of meeting artists. Uh, students are always looking for collaborations. Um, and end of year shows for art schools is a really good place as well. Um, uh, but really, I think getting involved with Hack Spaces and also then 
or similar kind of communities. And then also being kind to those kinds of artists and creative people who email and reach out to those communities. They tend, they can have a, a bad experience emailing a Hackspace mailing list or another tech e email list and kind of be looking for collaborators, but they're not using the right words or they're not quite using the right interactions that a lot of technologists would prefer for. And they can just kind of get flamed against for not really good reasons. So I think it's the sensitivity towards creative people trying to reach out. But I think there are, there are a lot of creative people who are looking at more technical community projects. That's the way. Questions? Yeah? Oh, oh there's one. Hello. Um, I'm very interested in the the sound design part of the the, the string yeah. thing. Um, can you give any technical hints on, on which programs we use and uh, how the with Max with Max for Life? Yeah, yeah. And well, so it was Ab all Ab Max MSP. Like, yeah, and Ableton, right? Uh, no, no. It was all generative right. from Max, all synthesized using. I think some more granular synthesis because Adam's been really, really hung up on granular synthesis for a number of years now. Um, uh, but it's using uh, the original clip that it's from, I believe is a bowed uh, violin, I think. And then it's using uh, the grain size and kind of uh, the low level what's happening with each of those notes changes according. So the, the kind of the, the timbre changes from the string. Oh, great, thank you. Yeah. Thank you.